essentially we have spent the last 15 years building a, a, a military that is essentially responsive to the kinds of challenges that Afghanistan and Iraq pose. Uh, ground forces heavy, uh, long presence in particular countries. I think increasingly our uh, military has to be more focused on expeditionary capabilities, naval, marine, and air, so that we can deploy, shape the environment, but uh, not occupy it, if you will. That process will take a decade at least as we shift our capabilities more from ground forces to naval and air forces. Mr. Trump, would you order aircraft carrier strike groups to the Taiwan Strait, as Bill Clinton did in 1996, to defend Taiwan against Chinese aggression? And if so, what would you do as president if a Chinese anti-ship ballistic missile sunk an American aircraft carrier? Ms. Clinton, do you believe China is explicitly building weapons to sink American aircraft carriers? And if our carriers are so vulnerable to Chinese attack, should we build more submarines instead of carriers? These presidential debate questions get to the very heart of American strategy in Asia, as well as the difficult politics of force restructuring. As Princeton's Aaron Friedberg has framed the problem. The military challenge that China poses to the United States requires some creative responses. And in particular, I think it's going to require the development of some military systems and capabilities, which have not historically been those that the US military services preferred. The Navy likes aircraft carriers. Uh, the top people in the Navy in the last uh, several decades have generally been people who rose up through the carrier branch. Uh, and yet carriers look like they're going to be increasingly vulnerable. We're about to spend $20 billion on carriers that are vulnerable. It's a technology that is now the first of the really big deck, uh, angled deck carriers came out about 1950, so 60 years old. According to the plan, the Ford class carrier will steam, the class will steam till 2100. That's about 150 years. That's like Lord Nelson's battleship, the HMS Victory, which was built in 1765 and was critical in the fight in 1805, would not have been so good 150 years later at the Battle of Jutland. I would not want to be one of the sailors in it. I don't want to be a sailor on a U.S. carrier. You cannot afford uh, the loss of an aircraft carrier with 5,000 men and all of its equipment. The financial and human loss uh, would be simply unacceptable to the Navy and it would be a great setback. The political effect of that kind of loss would limit our options going forward and compel us to a very forceful attack on Chinese facilities, probably mainland facilities. So having an aircraft carrier struck or a major capital vessel struck and sunk would be um, an option limiting event that could be very dangerous. So if surface ships can't come in in the initial round of fighting, I think that, uh, that means you probably try to go under the anti-access uh, perimeter using submarines. And the advantage there is that uh, U.S. undersea force is virtually unrivaled in the world. We are the best submarine force in the world, and the Chinese have historically demonstrated a weakness in anti-submarine warfare. So at the same time that we are taking advantage of our inherent strengths, we're also exploiting China's uh, inherent structural weaknesses in that particular area. If I were to, if I were to get my way on one, uh, one particular uh, priority, it would be build more submarines, more Virginia-class submarines in particular. So they're built just down the, down the road here in uh, Quonset Point on the Narragansett Bay and then down in Groton, Connecticut. And these, are, these have turned out to be very, uh, very effective platforms. Uh, the United States has already stepped up the construction rate uh, as it retires older Cold War era ships. It's actually, it's actually uh, plugging these new ships into the lineup. And that's a good thing, but uh, ultimately I think it, if I had my way, we would step up our construction of submarines just because the United, this is a key area of advantage for the United States and has been for many years, is submarine warfare. It's where we excelled during the Cold War. 
uh, it's, and, it's, and it's where we still excel today. The Chinese, for whatever reason, have not to date put a lot of effort into anti-submarine warfare. Uh, and I, so, so therefore, I think this is an advantage that will prove durable for the United States for, for quite some time to come. Of course, the major downside of any such a shift to an undersea strategy is that America would lose the important symbolic value that aircraft carrier strike groups provide in advertising American force projection. Yoshihara himself is the first to acknowledge this downside. There's a huge demand signal from our allies about the role of aircraft carriers. I think one of the interesting trade-offs is this. Uh, there are things that our submarines are very good at. The submarines are a great anti-access weapon. We can essentially deny Chinese access to the maritime domain, threaten Chinese sea lines of communications, threaten China's surface forces. But there are certain things that submarines fundamentally cannot do, and that is to uh, demonstrate American resolve through a, a show of force. Submarines, by their ma nature, have to be stealthy and undetected. Uh, and so in certain scenarios, only aircraft carriers can do the job of showing up to demonstrate American resolve by showing up off the coast of a country to say, we mean business. Submarines can't do that. So we have to very carefully weigh the trade-offs here because the things that carriers can do, submarines can't and vice versa. Uh, and so this is not going to be an easy force structure decision because our allies will not be looking at our submarines as a show of our commitment. They're going to be looking at our aircraft carrier as the primary sign of our security commitment to them.